Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the batch of XLRI PJPM GM 2000, we are excited to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Srikant Ramakrishnan, for the XLRI Industry Expo at Connect Series. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause. Mr. Srikant is the director of Climatus Group and he has an experience of over 20 years in various industries ranging from Percept Advertising Limited to now the Climatus Group. Uh, I would now like to request our con uh, convener, uh, Professor Kanarad sir, to please welcome sir with a book. subject that probably I'm asked to take is ESG and it can be as dry and boring as the desert sand. Right? So I'm going to make it slightly different. Just round of hands. How many of you know what ESG is? I mean apart from the full form of course. Okay. So there are two parts to this. I have 45 minutes. I'm going to walk and talk. I can't stand and talk. so. So the first part is a very dry subject of what happened between 2011 and 2022 and what became ESG. It's a very dry but a very critical component with legal protocol that you must understand. The second is a very more exciting thing. That's what's on that board. It's not very sharp an image but it has very many realistic uh, ramifications. If all of you think ESG is easy to understand and you guys know it well, raise your hand so I will skip the sad part and come to the fun part, which is the actual implementation of protocol. So we'll have lots of discussions. I have to put my hand up first and tell you I know very little about India and what happens here. You guys know much better than me. I am hoping to learn at the end of the session. So do you want to do the dry legal part first and then go to the next or should we jump and get into the fun? Jump and fun? Awesome. Awesome. I thought as much. That's why I didn't prepare much in ESG. <coughs> but one question I have to ask. What do you think is the relationship between sustainable development goals and this ESG protocol? Anybody? Pick your hand and tell me the relation between the two. The relationship between Sustainable Development Goals and ESGs, please. Anybody? A very shortcut route to finishing the dry stuff. Since you all know it, since we want the fun stuff, let's get the basics out of the way. Give me a shot, anybody. The laziest person in the class can have a first go. The laziest person. Who's the... <laughs> Nobody wants to come in. Are you sure? Yeah. Can you explain with one example? Uh, like uh, the government or the regulators in various countries and at a global level found that they Sit down, sit down, I can see you. Yeah. So that whatever we are deciding in COBs or any of the event regulations, how we can achieve those metrics? These are the certain tools and techniques which they use. Okay, you are partially right. Are you, so you are designated laziest person in the class? <laughs> okay. That part is the first part of the answers. No, that's correct. The second part is something called as Paris Convention. I think all of you know about it. Right? So the direct implication of the ESG today will be why it is a non-financial framework for measurement. Let's be very clear, it's a non-financial framework for measurement because one part of the world called the developed or western hemisphere that controls the dollar wants to maintain supremacy. 
Do everybody agree with that statement? Yes. Yeah? Such a such hush, yes. The others can also say yes or no. Yes. 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 So if that's the case, all of us understand that now there is a world that wants one part of the world to remain where it is and they want to accelerate themselves. Is that right? Yes. Is that the common understanding? Yes. yes. Having said that, so ESG is a non-financial metric to measure strength. Technically, right? Technically. So the question is, if you've done all that you've already done for the last three decades and now you want to put it under the carpet, you have a new set of rules, right? And you could call that the ESG. Because the SGDs have been around for donkey years. Nobody really bothered. Right? Until a Brazil says, I will not export this, and India says, I will not export rice. So those are the consequences of global economic power shifts. You must understand that this subject has a lot to do with power shift. You must also understand that this subject is not just about non-finance. It has a very strong underlying nature for finance as well. Because markets are finance. Anything that affects markets are also finance. Right? So this is very important component. Now for the fun stuff. Okay? So ESG is both economy, social, governance and all that. Right? What you see on the diagram here was actually something that was institutionalized in the EU Commission by the Swedish Standardization Institute. It's called SIS. Right? Now, what does this really say? The fulcrum of any planning for cities, for communities, for industries, for people has to start at the pixelated level of a family. So every single home is both an economic, social governance center that needs to get expounded in different ways. So that's why that is the axis right in the center. Right? So why I'm showing this specifically to you is for you to bear cognizance to what's happening around you. You're all in Jamshedpur and uh, of course Tata Nagar is the epitome of some kind of uh, very holistic growth model. So I think you have a good example that we can debate in this class today. So if the family and its social, economic and environmental impact is the axis of any kind of growth, okay, in a community level, what are its interactions? I've drawn a 360 degree pie and there is something called as food. If all of you can't read, which I believe you can't, this is food. Right? So all of us think the buildings, the roads, the infrastructure, the school, the education, the hospital, we think that's all there is to it in community building. However, we, we fail to understand and recognize that at a very, very more deeper level, Roti, Kapra and Matan, you back to the Hindi age, is really what ESG is all about. So Roti, Kapra and Matan is food security and food safety, basic infrastructure for housing, okay, including infrastructure for livelihood, plus a legal framework to keep you safe and to help you grow. I just given a very complex English definition to Roti, Kapra and Makan. Right? That is the center of this influx. So what you have here is a, in 2014, the Swedish Standardization Institute, of which I was one of the chairs, we actually commissioned this with the EU Commission, whereby city planning, at that time it was very famous to be called Smart City, right? whatever it became, had to have these constitutions. So what it meant was everything from you know IoT, everything from infrastructure, every all the parts of your life from birth to end are interconnected. So a grocery bill is connected to water consumption, is connected to waste clearance, is connected to your own carbon footprint, and is connected to the tax you will pay. <coughs> it's a little difficult to comprehend at first go, but give it a shot. Give it a shot. Everything you do, you're paying a price. Now, how much of a price is a consequence of how much of resource you're depleting? How much resource you're depleting is unfathomable by the pixel of the family. That's also one other reason why ESG is gaining so much popularity. ESG is 
a very complex model that tells you what you are doing and what you are expounding to expand. So now fall back to this little caricature here. Everything from the food you eat to the water you use or deplete to the services you enjoy are all part of your own footprint. In this matrix in 2014, we have not covered only one aspect available today to cover, that is the carbon foot miles and the sequestration model that you must all become aware of. Each one of us, depending on the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the amount of miles we walk and the, everything we do, we are deteriorating Mother Earth. How much ever smart you are, right? you are part of the system. So this is that component of ESG that you can make very detailed. It is the B2C version of ESG protocol. If all of you are really serious about you know, impact and any kind of impact, social, economic or environmental, then you need to have your own measurement at this scale, at this granular scale for understanding your worth in the community and on earth. I think that's the starting point. Why nobody is doing it in India? Well, the reasons are fairly straightforward. You won't get brownie points for doing it. An employer is not going to pay you 10,000 extra rupees per month for doing it. Nobody in the family is asking you to do it. There is no pressure. There is no recognition of even the basic fact that you owe yourself an answer. This is where we are stuck. We are stuck in a fairly rudimentary survival economy. Because of that, we fail or we choose to ignore, I would say that, not fail. We choose to ignore ESG as a price we pay. But just for this next 30 minutes, give yourself that understanding that you are now going to calculate your own burden. You are all a burden. We are all a burden. If we want to now calculate what kind of a burden we are, then it's high time we understood the ramifications of this burden. This actually is ESG. So my conversation with Mr. Kanakara just before entering here. So why is ESG not so popular? Enterprises here are not forced by the government. The government here does not have to fall back on a budget. But does that mean that you will continue to pollute and exploit your own environment? Because you are the one who is going to suffer. So it's time for us to take a real cognizance of this. So biking to work, even in 43 degrees sweltering heat, okay, might be extremely uncomfortable. But if three generations later they need to draw water from a well and not go more than 700 feet down, I think this is the price you have to pay. Till you understand the consequence of your present day actions for one or at least two generations later, this is not a subject that's easy to understand. But that is the level of ramification that you must be able to expound. Because that is the bloody truth. The bloody truth is you are wasting and wasting avariciously everything that you think is chalega. Okay, this chalega attitude, nahi chalega. Especially in ESG. You are not paying a price for it because nobody is asking you to. Eventually you will not have things to pay a price for. Then you will want to know, can I retrace time? And there will be no time. So let's go back to the basics. Why did I circle out food? Right? My line of work with the UNDP uh, makes me a food security analyst. So I'll give you a live example. In 2011, there were about 2600, 2617 exact cocoa farmers in Ghana. So cocoa farmers in Ghana produced the most amazing cocoa and coffee plantains and it's a highest grade as we call it. Today, there are only 418 left. So between 2011 and now, what really happened then? Apart from civil war, okay, apart from mutiny, there was a huge economic meltdown of that entire production being cannibalized by Latin America. So about Half of the entire farming fraternity for cocoa in Ghana got wiped out. And it only got wiped out for absolutely ridiculous capitalistic reasons. 
we all see movies of Italian dawns and Indian dawns and all that, and we think this is so cool, right? But the fact of the matter is, in a, in a span of one and a half decades, thousands of years of cocoa production were wiped out for capitalistic reasons. This might not affect you at all in any way, but one day you would want to ask yourself, how much time and how much effort is it going to take for the rest of the world for capitalistic reasons to wipe us out, one way or the other? Today, India is a very strong economy. We are trying to pull our string. We are doing well. Right? Even under these circumstances, there are things about India that India is not able to do rightly in the world economy. So you must bear cognizance to this. Since you are all sitting in XLRI, since you are all going to become man managers, since you are all going to have a streak of entrepreneurship in you, okay, which I hope is alive and kicking by the time you get out here, I think it's important for you to bear a very strong and serious cognizance to what's really happening in our business. Because there is no more an underlying factor for ESG implementation than that. The clothes you wear, the food you eat, the water that you don't even know you're exploiting and deteriorating, they are all certain scents of your own inflationary lifestyle that are killing you that are taking you away from your own goals. Okay? One part of ESG that is not very commonly dealt with, even in the Western world where I come from, is the legal aspect. Nobody talks about law. Nobody talks about uh, you know, the ironclad hand. That is because that legal function today does not exist. So you must ask yourself, why does it not exist? If all this is so critical. Why is there no legal overhang on this? Because the banks and the capitalistic headquarters of the world, in the Londons and the New Yorks and the Tokyos, are still trying to figure out who to penalize. This should also throw a fact to all your inquiring minds. That means someone is going to get butchered in the end. And who is it going to be? Somebody is. Somebody is going to pay a very heavy price. But who is it going to be? Because today, post-COVID, with the Ukrainian war, economies are staggering. Okay, we're a cat on a wall everywhere in the world. Nobody really knows you know, what's going to happen next. We can't have a six-month forecast. Forget a five-year plan. Okay? And if that's the case, and somebody were to call the shots and say, OK, these are the economies and these are the industries. They're going to pay a very heavy price for ESG. How will they survive? And if they don't survive, how the counterproductive industry survive? So effectively, a long story short is that ESG is also as minuscule as family. If all of you here can start taking cognizance of that and build a hundred meter circular wall around you and say I take responsibility for hundred kilometers around me, that's a great start. So what do you necessarily do? As local as possible is one very simple solution, but it's not that straightforward to implement. It's like almost saying, let's get back to Gandhi and Raj and you know, go back to Kali. But that's not essentially the end of it. Okay. What are the factors that are actually troubling us? Food is troubling us. Water is troubling us. Fuel is troubling us. What else is troubling us? What do you think are pain points in the world that you can't Lay a hand on, but you know something is going wrong. Take a pick. Pollution, yeah. And energy is troubling Energy, yeah. Clean energy. I'll come to it because that's another debate in itself. Yeah. Do you have something else? Reservation. Reservation of what kind? Reservation in India. Considering that air might not be available to breathe. Would reservation be a top priority or a difficulty? So in, in, the, in the sequence of priority, I would want to place reservation outside the top 10 bucket for now, just for now. Groundwater, yes. Shortage. Shortage, yes. Soil. Soil. Yes. See, we, we're all circling around food, water, and energy, right? Anything apart from that? There was a hand up. Forest fire? Yes. Yeah. Land in space. Land in space. 
Yeah. Food chain, yeah, still food water. We're still sticking to roti kapra mafan, right? So what have we done in the last 50 years of growth, so-called growth? Global warming. Okay. Pollution, global warming, greenhouse gases, yeah. Waste management. Waste management. Yes, management. Extinction of species. Yeah, I hope it happens. <laughs> For your and my species, our species must get extinct. So somebody else can survive. But I don't see that happening so quickly. I'm not so certain. <laughs> so effectively, what I'm driving at. So effectively what I'm driving at is everything that we are exploiting today is coming back to eat us. And what can you do about it? So now that we've heard enough problems, I've spent 22 minutes talking about problems. Now let's switch to solution, yeah? One of the things that uh, Scandinavia, I forget which Scandinavian country <coughs> is doing it is like they're taking the aluminum cans that they use for their beverages and they're actually putting them back into the earth and kind of creating four aluminum mines, kind of, you know, their own way of recycling. All of them, all the Nordic countries are doing that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, that's one of the ways to kind of, you know, you, you, you took it out of the earth, you put it back into the earth, so it's there for the next generation. That's okay. one solution. Anybody else? Solutions. You all now know the problem. No take a problem. So, for Like the sea water. See, it's like this, okay. Now, I think it's very exciting to own a Tesla and here. It's like state is simple, right? Having sold 218,000 Teslas, Sweden today has voluntarily decided to close the showroom down. You know why? Every 36 months, you have to overhaul a new battery. What would you do with 218,000 Tesla batteries that you cannot dump, bury, or explode? You can go fight a war. So, what is a status symbol in one country is almost a huge don't come near me in another country in a span of three years. Three years. Tesla's biggest factory and battery R&D unit is in a place called Malmo, which is south of Sweden. They have invested 13 billion US dollars in that R&D facility. With that money, Sri Lanka could unenslave itself from China. Okay? And we are going to shut that plant down. Why? Because those cars are not worth it. But Tesla is an aspiration value now, right? So where is ESG in all this? This is the exciting part. Because this is what, what I'm trying to do here is institutionalize your thought process. You're not thinking about it. Okay? But we haven't moved an inch. Apart from saying we are an amazingly, explosively growing progressive country, the real core problem stands. We are not looking at what we can do for generational solutions. We are looking for tomorrow. Our entire aspirational checklist or drawdown is still about tomorrow. Till such time you do that, this whole component of thinking is left to some academic <coughs> professor or chair who will go to the EU commission and submit and feel very good about it and have 10 PhDs working on projects. But is that solving any problem? Maybe out of the 10, two of them become entrepreneurs, they will be the next Tesla. Eventually, they also will have to have the next wave of solution. Are we solutioning? Are we solutioning? Anybody, take a guess. Are we solutioning? Sir, uh, we had a subject about uh, sustainability recently. Oh, I love that word. Please. And uh, we discussed many concepts of uh, Rebound effect and uh, uh, the new boundaries and uh, circular economy. But after going through all the concepts, I have come to a, an opinion. I'm cautiously using this word opinion. No worries, go for it. Without uh, reducing our consumption, 
consumption from aspiration uh, or bringing down our consumption from aspiration to as near as possible to near basis. Mm -hmm. I think there are no solution I see uh, which can actually help us or actually save. Because if we keep, keep on consuming, we are consuming up right now at 1.7 times and the earth can be Okay. So I don't see any circular economy <coughs> or from, uh, sorry, any circular economy concept or technology can actually help us. Okay. And you don't want to reduce the consumption? No, I am saying we have to do that. Otherwise, we cannot actually no concept. Actually, there are so many concepts we are discussing, but no concept can actually help you until we take it. Give me one example that you would contain yourself. So, for example, we can actually reduce our uh, frequency of purchase for electronics devices, our clothes, any consumption. What's your name? Amish. Amish, give me one example of what you will not do that your hand is itching to do. Yeah. Give me an example. What will you not do? Will you not buy another mobile? No, I'm saying I have to use mobile. Mm -hmm. Instead of using it or uh, changing it every two years, probably I try to use it for four years. Okay. okay. So, for example, this phone I'm using it for three and a half years. Okay. And I have a problem. Most of us in this classroom, okay, I want to take a common board. What is the duration of your mobile phone usage today? Three years. Three years. Three, years. three class, right? Everybody three class? Common board? So everybody is done that. Still nothing is happening. What next? Probably we can uh, also uh, think about our regular usage of probably uh, the food we are eating. Okay. Uh, what food. about the food? So uh, I read this interesting concept that we have to start eating food which are uh, grown local. Okay. So because when you drink food which is grown very far. Stop right there. Grown locally is a lovely concept. I have been speaking about it for 20 years. Why I ask you to stop the list? Don't you today waste more than you consume? Yes. Why do you buy? To waste. Why do you buy to waste? When are you going to get conscious of the fact that you are buying a whole loaf of bread and using only 60%? We just agreed with you. That doesn't happen that we are consuming more than. Yes. So, when are you going to think that your own buying pattern, local food, is phase three? Your immediate buying pattern is not even recognizing that you are buying to waste. I think until whatever is happening, like as an individual or as a community, it is getting monitored by the government or the agency. And they penalize you for things. Like if you produce a certain waste, you need to pay for it for recycling or collection of it. I think then might be. Why do you want the government? Where is your own DNA? Where is your own spine? So I think without. Mm -hmm. This is a good example. She's talking about Zara, okay? Now, it's a Swedish entity, so I love to talk about it. Yeah, go on. Now there are many companies uh, that are going into recycling. Yeah. So those that are It's called upcycle, right? Yes. So then you won't feel bad about buying them. Yes, yeah. upcycling clothes. So I think that would be a good solution. You know, where you know, see Why is it not caught up in India? Coming up. Actually speaking, if you ask me, one generation ago, your mom and your daddy's clothes were all upside. You just thought it was not fashionable to do so, so you chose Zara. Now Zara is doing what your grandmother did. Okay? And the elite want to upside the clothes. So what have you done? You pushed the problem to the mass middle class to say now you go buy it in the store. Right? Because what did Mr. Biani do in this country 10 years ago? It's a classic case study, right? What did Kishore Biani do? I mean, you guys recognize the name Kishore Biani? Have you read a case study? So what did he do? He took a conventional 7.99 shirt to 149 rupees and he said buy three. So what did the Indian mass do? We bought three. We used one. That would delay the purchase the next some years. Would it? Uh, in my opinion. Okay, unfortunately, it did not. It did not. Look at his stock prices. Look at the history of Mr. Biani's company. It expounded on consumerism. All comes back to you. All I'm trying to tell you is ESG is not some far off topic discussed in London or Tokyo. ESG can be what you need to think about today. 
right now because you are buying to waste and there is no waste management here let's be honest how many of us know what waste management is somebody spoke about waste management who is that smart alex yeah. so what happens in waste management you find ways to like the how to get this book uh, there how to properly get the disposal or to you reuse those uh, get the components out of it and how to reuse it so technically waste is dry and wet basics right the dry can be metal non metal it can be all of that wood for example it can all be repurposed the wet can be made into sludge and used in agriculture it's a process tata nagar was india's first waste management plant in 1971 it still runs that okay how i know this because the swedes maintain it okay, there is a huge money going on to the swedish economy because of that waste management plan so in all these four years we don't have a waste management engineering company or we decided our waste is not our problem or wo firangi company they do a much greater job why waste is money waste is energy <coughs> but we are ready to waste but we won't do anything about it this is personal esg guys time to think about it and to be very honest i think it's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity because if each one of you chose one sector and one esog aspect of it and decided to open your shop okay sitting here in this campus you get money you get funding because you have a market So what what does funding require? It requires a market and a good idea. So what's stopping you? Your thought process, because you're not thinking about it. If you just think for three more seconds on everything that you do, you'll realize everything that you point out is actually an entrepreneurial opportunity. I have not known a time in dimension in my 53 years where anything and everything you touch is actually a business opportunity. just that you need to know how to do it and you need to be able to say this will deliver the goods because i can't come every time to explain this to you but esg is just that and you're not you're not alone okay you have the whole world with you because this document was tabled on 21st of february 2014 in the eu commission in brussels i know the date because i did it in 2021 it became an esg protocol so you know no the whole world is living in the same euphoria that you're living you are just li- living on top of a market that world there is not living on top of a market so economic social governance protocol for non financial framework of reporting is a business entity it's not rule book this is the exciting part so now if you pay attention to this and i'll ask sir to you know send all of you this framework every bit of it is a business model if you think like that you might just might come up with solutions <coughs> apart from the business of course you might come up with a solution to handle that problem my drive as an innovation management consultant is for you to become that not to learn esg because i think we all know that academic excellence is great as long as you're inside an institution you have to live a life outside the institution and that life cannot be made out of this excellence so i think it's time for us to understand and recognize that esg apart from all the bells and whistles it has in the notebook is about day to day life and if you think of it as a business concept you may want to suddenly get serious about it because if you don't it is just going to be another lecture that you will forget this is the critical nature of why this kind of a framework actually gets people thinking it gets you thinking to understand that the food you eat is usually more than 50% water where does that water come from okay and what are you going to do about it if that doesn't exist it is packed in plastic that's never going to die what are you going to do about that 
and whatever you are buying, you are wasting 40%. Actually, it's just 10 rupees ki cheese, 4 rupees ki cheese, 4 rupees ki cheese, just think of it literally and then you will realize why the hell am I doing this. You are forced by habit. You are just forced by habit. I don't know how many of you drive your own cars here and if it reaches 100,000 kilometers before you change to another car. I don't think any self-respecting Indian does that. Right? How the hell would you drive a car 100,000 kilometers? Father, you can. You need a new car now. New color, new dimension. It's got LED lights that change color on its own. That's what we need today. The Koreans have that all scripted for us. But why? Why are we not using battery banks? Why is hybrid not catching up? It can't be just because of the price. It has a lot to do with consumerism. Because that is also a strong component of ESG that nobody talks about. This is what I wanted to inculcate in this class. It's not a dry subject in law. Because that everybody will do. What's the fun of it? If you can drive business and entrepreneurship out of a subject, because it deserves that position, I need you to start thinking. Because if you start thinking, hopefully, your kids will improve. Hopefully. If God still exists. Right? So that's about 45 minutes. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to ask. This framework will be available for all of you. My email is available to the professor. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Any questions? Yes, please. Sir, uh, as Amnis was mentioning also, like we have seen whatever the solution is right now happening, they are not sustainable. Like, for example, I was working in Siemens where we used to build the wind turbines. Now it is supposed to be clean energy. But now they are facing like how to uh, after the life of end of those big blades, how to waste them, like how to they are going to they're going inside the ground now. Yes. So so is there really a solution exist in human kind which is hundred percent circular or we have to go back to the cave days? That's the only solution I can think of it right now. I give you a practical answer and an academic answer. I like the practical answer like this. So where did that wind turbine come from? It didn't come from a day-day production facility. It came from an existing plant. This was its second shelf of life. Okay? Point number one. Point number two, it has a third shelf of life. Okay, But because shipping and supply chain has become so expensive, okay, a safer so-called tedious approach is land free. If somebody were to tax you on land free, you wouldn't do this. Because you would find a market in Sri Lanka or Ghana or Vietnam or Laos to ship it okay, by bearing half the cost of shipping. That's how it came to India in the first place. Okay? It didn't come straight out of a factory. If you get further down the points and doing that, if somebody gives you a tax rebate on your invoice or your LC, you would do it. Half of these measures are being put in place. For example, the state government of Gujarat tells you that all the wind turbines that are changed or you go into the next stage of 15% power upsurge, you get a 15% tax rebate on the next capital value. This is a damn good way to do it. Okay? All state governments can take this. However, they still don't do it. Okay, why don't they do it? Because I need mean, to think easiest way is to just buy it. Okay? They don't realize that when they buy it, somebody is going to argue. So this is the practical. Now the academic answer to this is all life cycles of engineering products okay, are beyond 40 years. All. Siemens is no exception. So that means it must have three consumer chains of usability and you are stopping it in the second or maybe the first. Whose fault is it? Who bears responsibility for killing a product well before its age of extinction? And why? This is ethical business code. Everybody needs to follow it. Everybody needs to follow it. Like you can't be in a cycle lane and drive like a bike. Okay, so if you are in a cycle lane, you need to be in a cycle lane, right? 
So this is academic answer is everybody has an ethical code because we have become so nonchalant about it. Okay, you choose to overturn, but there is still money in it. So there can be a business enterprise that only takes all the refurbished and repurposed, re-repurposed wind mines and make a living out of it. Right? That's also a possibility. Somebody does it for some time and then lets go. We are a country of the fireflies. So we do this for one instance and then we say, oh, awesome, and then we leave it. It's not just us, it's everybody. So actually speaking, no, we don't have to go back to being engagement. Everything has a process. And I'm hoping that with more and more intelligence coming in the young generation, you guys will start looking at those you know, product life cycles more judiciously and start implementing them. Because you can. You absolutely can. You will find somebody in Laos who will buy it for you at the same price that you bought it. What a good business deal. You just need to take the effort. Because you don't, you're stuck. Finally, it comes back to your thought process. It's super critical to understand this. So all these terminologies and the legal framework, all that aside, I'm trying to give you a very practical way of looking at it. Because I want you to remember this when you get out of this class. I don't want you to believe this is another chapter that we just had an external lecturer come and yap over it. Because this is not that. Or it need not be that. Anybody else? But there is a uh, concept called forced, forced obsolescence that companies follow. That, uh, for example, the mobile phones, they will uh, install bloatware and so that the mobile phone becomes obsolete within 5 to 6 years. So the consumer cannot do anything except replace the mobile phone. So there, shouldn't there be any onus on the producers that uh, they have to take initiative from their friend to be more sustainable? Okay, first part, the assumption that you had that sustainability is a consumer-driven economy, not entirely. Right? You can choose not to use them. You can choose to say, I will stay with the Nokia you know, 2660 for six more months till I get a ocean plastic replenished movie. But the producer also has a huge overhang. Okay? In this country especially, with laws becoming more and more open, okay? here, you will find a lot of reasons why producers are not have a backlash. But the onus of sustaining a sustainability concept is still the consumer's. Simply because you are the one driving that company to produce. He is not producing for you. He is producing because you ask him to produce. Please understand this. So the capital market as it functions is because there is a share owner. It's not there and then you became a share owner. No. There is already a huge share on a base, so there is a capital market. It's not a chicken and the egg story. Let's take problems into this fact. So sustainability is a practicable part of life. It's not fashion. It has become fashion because international banks have come and told you that large holding all over the country. Right? So they say, oh, no child labor. Hey, dude, child labor is unethical. But they very unabashedly put it on a 90 by 90 and you feel very nice about it. When you should be telling them, don't even write it like this because that's wrong. Because they really pulled out of countries because of child labor. But here it's a fashion statement. Right? It is up to us. So the thought process needs to start here. Whether it's ESG or sustainability. Then you will need uh, a tipping point of mass like anything else in science where you need to think to become autopilot. There, you need to bring better and better processes. So first is an intake, then is a process, and the last is the change. Unfortunately, we expect the change the moment we change. It won't happen. Whether it's sustainability or non-sustainability, in both cases, it won't happen. Anybody else? So I'm going to have base management entrepreneurs. <laughs> Sir. I was thinking, what if, uh, if we develop a ESG score for each product or service what is sold? So, for example, if I know a ESG score of S, 
and uh, I can make a judicious choice that I will get the one which has sure. uh, better EAC. Actually, sir, EU has an EAC score for every product CK. Okay. Every product sold under the Legal Act has a product score, an EAC score. And just like Six Sigma, there is it's a three light system. Okay. The red light is the one, unfortunately, they are prohibited to sell, so they ship that out. So this actually exists. Unfortunately, it's not gone beyond the EU Commission. It's not even gone to the US. So there should be ESG score. Yes. And consumers should be aware of it. Yes. When they consume it. Yes. And as well as the pricing of the product or service should be in tune with the ESG score. That is the part that's not happening. So pricing is still a complete yield management ideology. It works on the econometrics of demand and supply, right? But the ESG score is a very, very in the face part of packaging, it has got hugely in food security. It's got hugely in food security. It's not even moving out of Europe. There are two reasons for it. The cost of production in Europe justifies you to charge a premium, thereby this entire protocol of having a hierarchy for ESG score works. Anywhere else in the world, Singapore including, Hong Kong including, US including, no, the consumer market and the port is not ready to leave me that. Unfortunately, it is still a very socio-political debate. So the US Supreme Court does not want this to be done openly affecting consumers. However, it is laying a huge tax levy on producers who are not adhering to this. So it like like the Indian South Indian instrument Mridam, right? This needs to be bajowed on both sides. Right now one is happening, the other is thick. But yes, I agree. An ESG score will help. So coming back to the half consumption of the product, right, what you yes. said, it is not fully really consumed in the life cycle of the product. Correct. What if uh, the government imposes heavy disposal, I mean disposal tax? Yes. So if they impose heavy disposal tax, there is a likely chance that, that the product might be consumed till the life of the product. Okay. There is That's one. one. Number yeah. two is, um, I thought that uh, if you start extending the consumption of the product, mm -hmm. what will happen to the production cycle? And sure. How that is going to affect the economic cycle of the yeah. Good question. A very classic example of, for the first answer for you is the ship, ship breaking industry in India. We are amongst the yeah, world's absolute yeah. best when it comes to repurposing and extending the life of ship broken material. Okay? It's a huge thing, not because of the tax being imposed, but because they found a market. Because there is a lot of metal in it. Correct. And if they found the market, so the tax is not addictive. For all other classic examples where it has failed desperately is the railway. Okay? These are so unworthy okay, that they you cannot even make scrap out of it. And a tax, they don't have a choice. So they are stuck with yards and yards and yards of metal despite the disposal tax. In India, unfortunately, <coughs> the railways is a government entity. It's a central government entity. So everybody's hands are up. Nobody's really ready to talk about the money. However, the other aspect okay, of what happens to when you repurpose products, what happens to the production facility. This is also the birthplace of innovation. So then companies, because in Europe, this cycle has been monitored all the way from 1960s. When the repurposing industry takes off, then the innovation aspect of the original producer really takes off too. Then they start understanding that they have to create innovations that allow repurposing to push it further back. So they create supplementary revenue models on production. We are not yet there as an economy because our, in our life, Jugard is still fantastically functioning well. But there will come a time when our own producers will have to start innovating because the repurposing industry is the second economy and they are not the manufacturers. Anybody else? Yeah, there is a question. Please, finally, you move from there to there. So, uh, when we are asking about uh, PSD and uh, innovating products and then creating products which have PSG approved and everything. <coughs> so the prices of those products are a little bit higher today? No. Like most of the FMCG products I see in the market, they are higher. That's good. You are willing to pay a price for it. It's got nothing to do with 
Yes. So why would I have a willingness to pay when I can pay 20% less and I can buy the product? See, that's the whole issue. This aspect of consumerism, okay, or illusionary, you know, effect of aspiration. This has to drive you to decide what is right. We keep, you know, there is a common joke in India, right? Marwadi ke aad to paisa vasul hota hi hai. All of us can be madhus, no? We can all be very conscious about and not be penny wise, pound foolish. Why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? Ask yourself, do any consumer survey on any FMCG product. If, if it's got an international label, it fetches the premium of 10% or more. Explain to me why. You explain to me why. You are the consumer. Why is Nexa a better car out of the same Maruti showroom if just because the showroom is different? It's the same 6.77 mm tin used in a Nexa car and in a Suzuki car. Why are you buying from Nexa? Brand perception. Yeah. So who is at fault? Who is the consumer? The guy sitting in Sweden? This is what I am telling you that you need to become more conscious of your own thought trail. This is ESG is not legal subject. It's for you. If you decide to make this and don't think you are alone. Trust me, don't think you are alone. You are not. This is the whole influx of change. This is exactly what is needed. Today in a classroom, you are standing and asking one question. Ten people here are thinking of the same question. Minimum. Minimum. I'll give you an example. I went to IIT Kharagpur to talk about sustainable solutions using hemp. So IIT Kharagpur, in that class of 56, 21 of them owned hemp farms which their family stopped producing hemp. Because Andai nahi hai. try kiya kya? Nahi. Nobody takes the effort. Why do I talk about hemp? Because I am very really passionate about water conservation. 70 years ago, if you go at the history of the Himalayan sector, the English came and because they wanted poppy, they colonized hemp farmers and told them to grow poppy seeds. Hemp as a product can make paper and fiber using 91% less water than cotton and is a great fabric for this tropical climate. But unless a Swede comes and tells you this, you will not agree. If H&M brands it, okay, then you say, I will buy it. But if a farmer in Uttarakhand does it, like, no, 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 this is bad quality. Who is deciding this? The consumer. Why is the consumer deciding this? Because of a thought trip that is non-existent. Now is the time that you all need to come out of this. Because why? You have disposable income in your hand. You have intellect that you can take that far. And you have intent to do something right. If you don't change now, I don't know when you will change. Think about it. It's in your hands. It's bloody hell in your hands. Don't put it for somebody else. So repurposing is also re-engineered entrepreneurship. You have to think like that. You have to. Yes. Uh, it has a lot of benefits out of it. I had uh, my classmates from my school uh, have a startup called Hempers, which is producing uh, hemp products. Okay. And they were like, telling all of us all the benefits of it and then you should the usual marketing things. But then they told me that in order to source good hemp, they had to go to Uttarakhand because most of the governments aren't. Uh, I am not sure if it's they are allowed to cultivate it or the trade. I am not sure. I think it's the cultivation part. So why is the government stopping it if, if it has a lot of benefits? The real truth about hemp, because I am a hemp farmer myself, okay, and my hemp is growing in Uttarakhand, is you need 8,900 feet above sea level temperature. Hemp is airborne. Okay, I don't need water in the ground. I need that air molecular and hydration. So that altitude only you can grow hemp. Point number one. Point number two, the hemp that's grown in India, most of it which is not in Uttarakhand, 
the seeds come from Canada or Brazil. They're not indigenous hemp seeds. Okay? That's a big problem. That's a big, big problem. Only Uttarakhand and Himachal have indigenous hemp production because it grows like wild fire land. Now, the technicality of hemp is the plant itself can be used in very many ways. There is something called as THC, okay? which is what makes it cannabis. <coughs> Right. If you let it grow, it will become 100% dope. You need to know how to cultivate it. So if you leave it to the regular farmer, he may or may not do it. Okay. He judiciously. That's why you need a thinking brain to get behind it. So technically, why Uttarakhand? Because of the location. Because of the moisture in the air. Okay. Because of lack of salinity. Hemp cannot survive in saline air conditions. Cannot survive. But it's a great market, without a doubt, and it's a great Indian market that makes it even more greater. Like I've heard that they have a lot of people coming together for trade shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we are all using seeds from Brazil. So as a purist, I would hate that. I'd rather have Indian here because it's ours. Yes. Individual consumers that we are talking about more, going more on a global level. So, as Anish was also stating, we had a sustainability uh, lecture in previous talks. And uh, just an insight from my side, and I would like to hear your opinion also. So, uh, in de what, what's happening is in developed countries and in developing countries, the policies uh, are very different. Like in developed countries, policies are way more strict than here. Like, a uh, person, if a person dies here on uh, work site, then the penalties are like 10 times or 20 times less and there the penalties are more. That is why in uh, developed countries, the uh, companies they like to, you know, set up their plants, R&D, everything in developing countries because they know they can deplete the resources and, and the penalties is less, for the death the penalty is less. So they prefer, okay, we'll move the, to the developing countries and we'll set up our plants there. So, I uh, mean, why are we, as a developing country, why are we not uh, making our policies more strict so that uh, such practices are, you know, the way uh, they follow the more strict practices in their countries, they start following the same practices here also. That will make a difference because just for the sake of, you know, giving someone employment, you are depleting their resources. So, uh, that's like, a, it's just there showing us that good picture that we are giving you employment. And we are also silent, okay, we are getting, getting employment, so what's wrong, what's wrong with that? But uh, in reality, uh, something needs to be changed. The policies should be more strict. I started the lecture by telling you that this is a geopolitical subject, right? This is pretty much where you're ending. So what you said as convenience of labor law okay, is only the tip of the iceberg. The real thing, me, is the raw material. The raw material being sucked out of India as a nation cannot be compensated economically. India is very slowly but very surely waking up to this. Okay. However, there is a huge economic movement. It can't be a snap of the nanos. It is a very judicious balance between contribution to national GDP, both numerically and non-numerically. At the same time, it is slowly asking them to stop using the resource or pay a higher price. Unfortunately, pay is what we have done as a government over the last 15 years. That is not enough anymore. Do you know that now, from being the world's largest exporter of rice since 1947, all the way to 2021, we don't export rice to India. Because the Prime Minister went to a World Trade thing in an FAO conference and the WHO he said, okay, India needs to feed its poor and its middle class. So they will not stop exporting rice. For a nation to take a stance from being the highest exporter to not exporting is a big drive. So I will never say that we are not doing the right things. Because I am seeing, yeah, but it is it is a geopolitical you know, it's a puzzle, it's a chess game. Okay, we want to be checkmating the others at the end, but right now we still, you know, the pawns are playing each other. We are trying to move the elephant here and there. We are doing a lot of elbowing, but that's good because we are elbowing in economic strategy, not in social. 
So far, we were the recipient of fund because we wanted social impact. Today we are saying, no, no, social impact will go on our own. Now let's talk money. Slowly, we will start you know, gathering more momentum and we will say, okay, dollar dollar thick, but I want to trade in rupee. You don't understand the importance right now of what it means to have a globally traded currency. So the bedrock of capitalism is a single powerful currency. It's not the market, it's not the people, it's the currency. So the bedrock of economics and geopolitical turmoil is that supreme currency. Yes, and ESG is all of that, right? It's governance or social and then it finally economic and it's the currency. That single supremacy is getting shaken really bad now. There are a lot of powers coming into play and it's a good time for India to raise its head and say, I'm also in the race. Right. But for that and for all of this, everybody needs to be involved. It's not the government alone, it's not the people alone, it's not the environment alone, it won't work like that. It has never worked like that. So the world is today witnessing a game of chess and we're all in it, whether we like it or not. And technically we should be good in chess. You know, that, that's what is in our DNA. So I hope we go in the right direction. Anybody else? Yes, please. Oh, you can ask, I hear you. Uh, sir, uh, the question was regarding him. Uh, as you said, you are uh, one of the few persons who are throwing it. Uh, uh, few months back, uh, when it was still COVID, I mean, uh, now we are close to an year, so an year back when it was still COVID, I uh, happened to meet a stranger on Omegal who was a hemp farmer. So he was from Nepal, so he was telling how he is growing it and the government supports it. And he is using it for his own consumption for medicinal purposes and he was also growing poppy uh, and the government takes a huge uh, stake in that and they are paying well. And uh, they have uh, quite uh, uh, in terms of uh, exposure uh, towards it. But if we compare here, uh, there is a different mindset, there is a different dilemma when it comes to him. It's always the negative part uh, they get into. They don't consider it from consumption point of view. And uh, recently there have been many companies like Indian Hemp Company, the Bangalore uh, Sisters here yeah. started uh, selling it uh, for their pets initially and uh, now they have started branding it for uh, uh, normal uh, consumption as well. So when these things are legal and when we get to see them uh, uh, not more often, uh, why shouldn't government come up and uh, educate people that okay this is also one way in which we can uh, commercialize this and uh, because we know uh, if it isn't commercialized, commercialized it still sells however it's not factored into the economy so uh, don't you think that the government should step ahead and promote this or is it the fear of exploitation in areas like Uttarakhand because you said that there are certain uh, uh, climatic conditions which facilitates growing this since we don't have many Uttarakhands around so is it uh, that I is not for that yet. God, we don't have many <laughs> See, the answer is both, I'll give you again a practical and uh, academic answer. Okay? The academic answer is, I come from Tanjore. Okay? There is a particular kind of salt that we make, we get from our soil. That's extremely amazing. Have you ever had Igli with something called as Mulagapuri or Gun Powder? Yeah. So, like that, every little facet in this country, right? has its unique contribution to life. Okay. Cool coffee is one. Okay. Kerala banana is the other. Uttarakhand is got nice. If the government want, wants to promote everything everywhere, okay, I think we need a larger chief marketing officer portfolio. That's one. The practical answer is this. I think safeguarding uniqueness and maintaining indigenous trade secrets within those subsect and communities is as important as making it marketable. The fallout of a scaled up business is far more detrimental to the original farmer than him not having a market. Think about it. All over the world, okay, I'll give you a classic example of samurai knives. 
there are exactly five monasteries in the whole world. All of them are obviously in Japan that make a samurai knight. It is mandated not to go out of that boundary. And I absolutely agree. I can't think of any okay, intellectual property professional, because that's the legal profession I come from, who would say that samurai knights have to be made anywhere in the world. No. It's a trade. It's a secret. It's a 10,000 year old legacy. So is hemp. So is Malagapadi. So is Baan Ki Namak. So why do you want to make a business out of it? It has a scale, it has a repertoire, it has a market. Let's just keep that to it. Okay? Today we are not even doing that. Why are we not doing it? Because there is a lot of anti-marketing or anti-product. So if you do take hemp to Ayatabad, of course, first question I would want to know, myself as an Indian, where is the legitimacy behind this? Second, I know that the seed comes from Canada. So then I would say this is not Indian. Okay. Whole characteristic changes. Another example, in Odisha and Assam, the kind of bamboo you get okay, is better than Japanese great bamboo. But you know Indian bamboo sells for 1 rupee and Japanese bamboo the same size sells for 1000. Why? Because that's Japanese. Right? So also all of this, I think having curtailed, well restricted markets is also a great idea. It's like having your own akhara. You don't have to go fight every restaurant. Salman Khan or Sultan Bane Rao, think very good. Again, I'll go back to something called Maslow's hierarchy. Okay? Self-actualization is also a trade. Time we practice that. Because we are damn good at something, right? Why do, does the whole world need to know? Why does the whole world need to know about yoga and Ayurveda and homeopathy and our own remedy? The concoction that your daddy gives you for cold. Never made you have COVID. But why does the world need to know this? When you get COVID, you will get that concoction. End of story. That's also one way of looking at it. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Okay? But that's as local as you can get. You don't need to fall at the feet of a Pfizer for an injection shot. <coughs> that's also a way of looking at it. It's still thought process. Thank you. Yes, please. On behalf of XLRI and the entire student fraternity, I would like to thank you for taking out the time for this leadership talk, sir. You have not only provided us with an understanding of ESG principles, but have also highlighted their significance in the current global landscape. Economies are staggering in more ways than one, and we need to understand to work towards the solutions on a generational level. Your emphasis on the role of the companies in promoting sustainable practices and ensuring social responsibility has left us all thinking, are we really solution? I'm sure that it will inspire many of us to adopt more sustainable and responsible practices in our personal and professional lives. I would now like to request our placement convener, Professor Kamagrasya, to present Mr. Srikant with a memento as a token of our gratitude for his presence. Once again, thank you very much, sir, for this presentation. It was truly an enriching experience for us, and we hope to have the opportunity to hear more from you in the future. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.